I got a, I got a fourth grader this year, uh, my son, and he he just started playing trumpet, and uh, yeah. And so so what I've been doing is I've been taking a lot of the first day's lasting ways um, concepts, and I've been using it on him. He's kind of been my guinea pig to see if this thing is practical for 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 nine or ten year olds or whatever. And man, he is flourishing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio-on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you knew one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now my next guest, Mickey Smith Jr. Hi, Mickey. Hey, how you doing, Mark? Well, I'm doing as best as can be expected right now. How are you? Man, great. And and look, man, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Looking forward to uh, just sharing a little bit about the craft, man, and, and, and what makes this thing called music so great. Absolutely. So I'll just, you know, podcasts are out of time. They're asynchronous for the most part. But so everyone knows we're recording this kind of the, the middle of March 2020, and we're kind of in the middle yeah, of the, wow. the, the virus preparations and things are a little bit crazy, but we're going to carry yeah. on and talk about band and make ourselves better today what it's all about but it's definitely a time i don't think anybody will ever forget we'll always remember where we're at in this moment so uh i think it's even more powerful to have this opportunity to share in this time where probably people need it the most you know so thanks again oh my pleasure i'm happy you could join us so i i'm going to have you introduce yourself you have had quite an honor in the recent last couple months but i'll let you share so can you tell the listeners about you about yourself yeah so um yeah it's, it's been you know, as crazy as the year is, it started phenomenal. I've got to be honest with you. Um, you know, folks that, that uh, know me here locally know me as a band director, but, you know, a, a lot of things um, happen over time. And for me, I was a kid that grew up in a little community. I call it a forgotten community. Um, didn't have a lot of opportunities, but music was my avenue. It was my door for more, you know. And um, through it, I got scholarship and I've traveled. And most importantly, I've gotten this opportunity to impact youth with music and fast forward, you know, as a kid, you think maybe one day you win a Grammy or you win something that, uh, as a result of this beautiful thing called music. Well, you and I both know, you know, band directors, music directors don't win Grammys. That's for, that's for the icons. That's for like, you know, you, you Michael Jackson or you, whatever, you know, you, your iconic Elvis Presley, different people like that. Um, but then something amazing happened a few years back. The Grammy started, an, an acknowledgement of educators because somebody had to start everybody. And I thought that was so powerful. I remember back in 2014, I saw this award for the first time, had no idea that, you know, just a few short years later, I would be the person receiving this award. So on this past January 26, uh, I was in Los Angeles with my wife and, and a couple of friends, and I was receiving this year's Grammy Music Educator of the Year Award. And uh, it's been it's been an incredible experience. It's almost like a, a dream, if you could imagine, man. It's been amazing, amazing. Yeah, well, it's it's terrific honor. I can't imagine. And you know, I, I it's I want to thank you for what you do. And like, I mean, to me, when it, whenever I see that award everywhere, I feel like it's our award. You know what I mean? The band directors, Absolutely. the choral directors. I mean, you know, the orchestra people out there. We're, we're you know, it's it feels like you're accepting it for all of us. And but yet you're but but yet you're doing it because you're standing out in the field. And and that's it's can't wait to talk to you more about it. Most definitely. So thanks. Yeah, it's 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 uh. It's, I always say we're better together when we band together. And, and for this award, it was just that. It was an opportunity, I think, to encourage others and, and show them what's possible, you know, um, because it definitely was for me. It was, it was such a morale booster uh, because we all do. We put in that, we put in that work, man. With, as music educators, it's, it's sometimes a thankless job. 
So anytime you get something that can bring recognition, not just to yourself, but to this, this profession as a whole, man, that's, to me, that's a game changer. So I, I definitely thank the Grammys. I thank Ford Motor Company and all the folks that, you know, took time to see that, hey, there's a, there's a segment of folks out here who are making a difference in a powerful way. Absolutely. So tell me about your background. You mentioned a little bit about growing up in a town that you call a forgotten town. What, what do you mean by that? And, and how did you get your start in music? Yeah, so I grew up in this little town called Moss, called Mossville, Louisiana. Okay, so if you look for Mossville on a map, you probably won't see it anymore because it was already a small town. You know, some people say they got a one one stoplight town. Our town was so small we didn't have a stoplight. Like we had nothing. So uh, I grew up in this little town and I discovered music, but music was my opportunity to to expand my horizons. I got to actually go to a different school than some other friends did. And it afforded me opportunities to travel and explore more. And uh, with music, it was just a powerful thing. I say forgotten community because that town is no longer there. It actually, the whole town has been bulldozed. And now it's, a, it's like a chemical plant there. It's, it's really sad uh, because you, 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 don't miss, you don't miss certain things until they're gone. And community, to have an entire community gone, uh, it, it's something that is really provoked me to make sure that I make every moment count, you know, with my students, that, that I help create some sense of community for them. And I guess that that, that has grown out of, of having lost, you know, so much. But uh, like I said before, music, it was a great thing, you know, in that little town, it was kind of like a Mayberry, it was more of a rural setting. And I'll never forget my first sounds on my horn were absolutely amazing, really terrible. Uh, so bad, in fact, my mom, when I made my first sound, she told me to keep on going. But uh, when she said keep on going, she actually meant go outside. And uh, I took my horn outside. And every time I played, my mom would come back with a little bit more encouraging words saying, son, keep on going. And this narrative continued until I ended up down the driveway, across the street. And I would practice my saxophone in the forest, in those woods, that little town called Mossville. And that's where I developed my gift and my skill uh, on the instrument, not realizing that that would be the very thing that would afford me to be the first in my family to go to college. Um, so I tell you all that because music was an absolute game changer for me. And for me, when I come into the classroom, uh, obviously I love music. I'm still a performer. Um, I want my kids to enjoy the music, but aside from the music, I also want them to have the community. I want them to have that feeling of belonging. I want them to know that they're part of something bigger than themselves. And I want to give them opportunities as well. And for me, music was that opportunity that afforded me another opportunity that led to another opportunity. And that's why I tell my kids all the time that if you, if you put all you can into it, it'll give you so much more. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about your, your story growing up here and, and like, I can't imagine my home not being there anymore. And, and I think it really speaks and you talk about community and it's obviously something that's so important. And, and I think about like when I was a kid and I say this a lot on this show, people who listen are probably tired of me saying it, but you know, when I was a kid, man, the band hall, the band room, that's like where I was safe. I would eat lunch there. I went there before school, after school. That was the period I look forward to or two periods as I got older and got into more groups, you know, that was home. Yeah. We, uh, we actually open up. I, I can't agree with you more about that. It's, it's home, man. It's not a class. I tell my kids all the time, I don't, we don't offer a class. We're offering them an experience. And, you know, you can get a class anywhere. You can get a lesson anywhere. But an experience is something that stays with you, sticks with you. It lasts for a lifetime, hopefully. And, and, and even, like you talked about before, creating that home atmosphere. Um, in the mornings, we open up our band hall before the school uh, opens, so to speak. And it allows the kids the opportunity to come in here and, and, and work and just connect. Because sometimes kids maybe in different classes, you know, uh, separate from their friends and different things like that. So we have them come in and, and I have uh, a young man who, who assists here at my school in the mornings and he goes to another school in the afternoon and very early uh, with our time together, he asked me, why do you open up the band hall? He's like, they should just take it home and practice. And I said, yeah, they should. But we never know what somebody's home situation is. You know, uh, I'm even thinking now, you know, for some kids being quarantined is an absolute nightmare. If they're in a home with an abusive person, you see what I'm saying? Or, or, or even if they're, if they're, I've had kids that were homeless, you know, I've had kids that, that would maybe, maybe it's not that dramatic. Maybe they just live in an apartment complex and it's not conducive 
you know, for that, but they want to grow. They want to get better. Well, then we provide them this, this safe space, this place where they can grow and go to that next level. So, you know, musically it's a home, but also, like I said before too, you know, it's, it's that place where they can find themselves. I, I say all the time with my opportunity called teaching that I don't help kids discover just the sound of the instrument, but I help them discover their unique personal significance, their purpose, their passion. That's your personal sound. So each and every day, my mission is to help them discover their sound through the sound of music. And when you find your sound, you found home, you know? I always, my, my saying is I don't teach kids how to play the clarinet. I use the clarinet to teach kids. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And I wish more people would remember that. You know, it's so easy for us to put our perspective on someone else. You know, for, for so many uh, educators, band directors, we forget that we do more than teach, we reach. We forget that we do more than instruct, we inspire if we're doing it right. Because at the end of the day, they're not us. See, see if we're on that podium, then we were exceptional to some extent. You know, if, if we were on that podium, we were exceptional. We weren't the norm. But I, I, I see so many folks, they come into their classroom expecting everyone to have the same type of passion. And everybody has different gifts. Everyone has a different sound. You know, it, you would never try to make the flutes sound like the tubas, but you can let, allow them to compliment one another. But so many times we're trying to make our kids um, love it and see it the same way we saw it. And sometimes it's not even a matter of getting them to see it like we see it. Sometimes it's a matter of us seeing them just seeing them, who they are as an individual. And when a kid sees that you see them, then they'll do anything for you. I say all the time, you can con a con, you can fool a fool, but you can't kid a kid, man. Kids know when you're in it, when you got the heart and, 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 and you want to see them be better. And the beautiful thing is in my class, um, our mission is, I don't want to be able to tell who first chair is. Everybody should be first chair. Everybody should have a certain level. Now, of course, some will rise to the top. That's, that's normal. But, but everybody should be proficient on their instrument at the particular level and age they're at. And, and we do a fairly good job of that. And I don't say that to brag or boast, but to, but to share with somebody out there who may be, you know, after third chair as a, as a, as a sharp drop off in the performance level. Uh, that, well, there's some things where we do in this class where we, we show them that our responsibility is not just ourselves, but it's toward one another. And there's some things I call first days lasting ways that we do in the beginning of the school year that really sets the atmosphere for a, 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 a shared experience with everybody, with everyone being successful. Can you walk me through that? That sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I, coming into teaching, you know, I, I, I would go observe people and I saw where everybody that I was looking at, they were doing all the worksheets and the theory sheets. And there's nothing wrong with that. Let me go ahead and clarify this. Fantastic. We love the theory sheets. Okay. And they're doing all this stuff. And, um, and then some people I saw like day one, like they had instruments out, you know, and they were, they were playing and, and, you know, trying to, you know, with beginners. And I just kind of watched and it just, it just occurred to me over the years of trying to different ways that there's gotta be a better way. Um, because what happens is everybody loves band the first week <laughs> until they realize they have to practice. And it, and it was amazing. The drop off in interest and, you know, the apathy just, you know, skyrockets through the roof. And I'm thinking, how can, what can we do to fix this? So um, I, I'll digress for a second. Uh, an amazing thing happened with this Grammy award that, sh that you referenced earlier with the Grammys, Alicia Keys was the host. She was supposed to be on the stage and just from the stage recognize me with a video montage playing behind her. Well, I would imagine due to the death of Kobe Bryant that morning and some other factors, the, the program is very fluid and they're making changes constantly. And they made some changes. And as a result, I think they ran out of time. So what happened was 30 seconds before commercial break, they're like, yeah, by the way, she's going to walk down to you. And I'm like, holy crap. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so all they told me was sit down, you know, don't say anything. She's going to walk to you. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, OK. And I had literally like 30 seconds to process this information. She walks up. I tell you all that to say that when she walked up, she reached out for my hand and she, you know, she grabbed my hand or held my hand and she said, we need you. We need you. And I knew what she meant in that moment. And I share with folks since then that in essence, what she's saying is we need educators. 
such as yourself. We need music education. We need the arts. We need that thing that brings all of it together in a meaningful and powerful way. I totally got that. But what Alicia Keys had no idea of knowing, and if I would have been shell-shocked, I probably would have told her, and hopefully I'll get another opportunity, is that um, my first day teaching, my first day teaching, I was so scared and I was so nervous. I blew through my script because they told us, you know, how about a script, what you're going to do, and a little bullet points and lesson plans. I blew through everything, man, in 15 minutes. <laughs> I had nothing <laughs> left. So here I am with about 30-plus minutes left of class, and I have nothing. And I'm talking to the eighth graders who are upset because I'm replacing their band director. You yeah. see what I'm saying? I'm oh, the yeah. new guy. And eighth graders never like the new guy. So uh, I found out later through one of my students who is now an administrator. She's a, she's a um, curriculum supervisor in Africa. Okay. She's left the States and been teaching out there for a few, uh, about a year or so. She said, Mr. Smith, you had no way of knowing this, but we, we were going to get you, man. We had plotted on you. We decided we were going to give you the business and, make your life so miserable you quit and the other band director would come back because this is the logic of an eighth grader. Okay. So, uh, so she says, we were all set to get you, but then when you ran out of stuff to say, you grabbed your horn because when I, when I ran out of stuff, I went for what I knew. I grabbed my saxophone and I began playing a, a song for them. That was popular at the time. The first song I ever played as a teacher was Alicia Keys. If I ain't got you. And when I played that song, I had them, man. It was like, they, they I don't know, it was something powerful about it. Like when I played it, the kids, the kids just bought in in that moment. And that opened up a door for me to, to continue to pour into them. And I just think of how funny is it that life's full circle like that. I had no idea when I played Alicia Keys' song that I'd be meeting Alicia Keys. And, and all that to say in the first days had nothing to do with teaching. In the first days, kids generally just want to know a few things. They want to know... First and foremost, who is this individual as a person and what do they mean to me? And that's what kids want to know. So what I do is I share my story with them. Um, I share a version of what I told you earlier about keep on going. Um, and, and that story becomes our mantra for the year because anything that we do that's worth anything is going to be a result of our patience, of our perseverance, of our persistence, of our ability to keep on going. That's what band's all about. You know, it's, 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 it's wrapped up in that ability to develop the grit, but that doesn't mean that won't be fun. So another thing is I show them, what are we going to be doing this year? And, and we spell it out. See, these are simple things. I've, I've, I'm amazed when I go into classrooms, how many times we just assume that kids know what band is. <laughs> There's so many folks, they just assume they know, but I break it down. And I show them where their value, where the value is, you know, where they're supposed to sit, how they're going to be graded. Basic, basic things that I find sometimes, um, sometimes our core curriculum teachers have this stuff on lock. I mean, they really have this stuff down pat, but we as music educators are in such a rush sometimes to get into the music that we don't really see the kid, that we forget that this is their first year in fourth grade, their first year in middle school or junior high school, and they're scared to death and they don't care about a quarter note and a half note right now. But if you can show the kid, Hey, I see you. If, you, if they can recognize that they mean something to you and that this, this, this class, a.k.a. the experience, is going to mean something to them, you got them. You got to hook them, man. It's, it's, a, it's a what's in it for me generation. And that's fine as long as you can show them what's in it for them. So through a PowerPoint and through a system that I have, I go over all the things that are important to them. And once I show them the value, then I start with showing them not only that, but we have a compass that we use in our class called the code of cooperation. And that's a litany of non-musical things that we say daily. And somebody's like, you say them daily? Yep, I sure do. Matter of fact, my buddy of mine says I brainwash the kids. Well, I don't know if I brainwash them, but it's, you know, I, I believe you are what you habitually do. All right. So, so was it uh, Aristotle said excellence is, is, is not, you know, it's not by happenstance. It's, it's a habit. It's something I, we form the habits and the habits form us in essence. And, um, we do that each and every day. And with those, those seven little things that I do each in my class to start each lesson, it not only serves as a bell ringer, but it also serves as a classroom management tool. For example, each and every day I start off class by saying first one is, and they say the first one on the code of cooperation, which is follow directions. 
Now, I ask you, Mark, why, why is the first one is follow? Why is follow directions the first thing on the code of cooperations? Why would you imagine? Well, because everything flows from that. There you go. Everything flows from that. You know, I see so many folks, they got like 20 rules. <laughs> they got 20 rules. Like, and here's the deal. With a kid, um, there's a gentleman named Harry Wong, who's a classroom manager. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. First day of yeah, school. Yeah, Matt. There you go. There you go, man. I, I love his stuff. Um, I'm so honored. I'm, I'm actually, um, I got to share this with somebody, man. I just found out I'm, I'm going to be uh, one of the individuals he features in his next book uh, because a lot of his practices, you know, a lot of the practices in my class, uh, I just have to be honest, are a direct result of things that I've, I've picked up and gleaned from, from his books. And they work. They work in a band setting. They work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so when you look at follow directions, this is the thing that drives band directors crazy. Had I not found this out earlier, I might still have hair. Uh, I, I bald just a little bit. I think if we'd have got this follow directions thing down, Pat, uh, it would have it would have salvaged my hair a little bit. But but I say that because now um, when I do this, it's almost like was it Pavlov with the dogs, the yeah. training and whatnot. Yeah. If you do something long enough, it becomes automatic. My wife laughed at me so much. We were in the mall one day, and uh, we're down here in the South, man. So marching band, you know, football is big. Marching band is big. So as drum major, you know, the drum major claps everybody up, clap, 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 and then we'll say band, 10 hut, you know, everybody comes to attention, you know, it's powerful, hey, go band. Well, <laughs> 10 plus years of marching in, in band, there's a certain cadence, there's a certain tempo of a clap. If you hear it, you I automatically go into a uh, attention mode. And we were walking in the mall and somebody just happened to be clapping. And when they clap like that, I stopped dead in my tracks. And my wife laughed. I met her in, in band. She's a French horn player. She laughed. She laughed. And, but she knew. She knew. Like, you know, it's, it's, I'm conditioned for it. And the same thing is true with my students. Anytime I say first one is, they shout back, follow directions. Hmm. Because that's how we start class. Now, why is that so powerful? Because I want you to imagine if you're teaching and you're in a classroom setting and you've told the kids, hey, turn to measure uh, turn to page 12, look at measure three. And of course they play measure 76 of page 142, you know, like that's that just, just the, the total wrong thing, you know? And, and sometimes it's those small things that just drives us crazy. And I've seen people start fussing at the kids. Hey, didn't I tell you to go to page 12? And, and really it's emotional and you never want to get to that point where they're pushing buttons. So for me, if a kid doesn't do what they're supposed to do, instead of me fussing at them, I just say, class, first one is, and the whole class says, follow directions. Uh Why is that significant? Because if I tell them to do something, then it's that that old guy, man. That's Mr. Smith, man. He's just tripping. But when your peers tell you, hmm, that's significant. And it takes takes the pressure off of me, and it always puts it back. It's not, hey, hey, guys, it's not me. I mean, if it was up to me, you could do whatever you want to do. But that doggone code of cooperation, man, that pesky code of cooperation, it keeps us honest. And it also keeps me honest because if I'm getting bent out of shape over things that are not in the code of cooperation, like follow directions, raise your hand to speak, stay in your seat, be prepared, respect property of others, treat others with respect, gum candy, food or drinks are not allowed. If I'm getting upset about that, about something, and it's not in those things, then it's probably not as big of a deal as I'm making it out to be, you know, and maybe I need to check myself. But the biggest thing about that is I start the school year off showing them how this is not about don't do this, don't do that. Because as I mentioned before, Henry Wong says a procedure is a do, but a rule is a don't and a don't is a dare. I promise you, it's as old as time. Don't eat that fruit. Don't cross that, that fence. Don't the very thing you tell somebody to do not to do. That's what they want to do. So I don't spend time telling them and putting up boundaries. I spend time empowering them. So what I do is I give them what I call the GPS for success in the first days. What's the GPS? Guidelines, procedures, and strategies. I show you how to win. I'm taking to a place called success. And when you present it that way, coupled with what I shared with before in the PowerPoint, what will we show them who this teacher is as a person and, you know, what their role is in the class. Then it sets a beautiful springboard for a, a sound school year, which I call a sound 180. But it all starts with the first days creating what I call lasting ways. And we've never played the instrument yet. That's the crazy thing. And, and I've had some folks, you know, at this point in the year, 
you know, at, when I say they hadn't played an instrument, it's like August, you know, early September. We hadn't played an instrument yet. And, and I'll have folks asking me, they'll say, hey, Mickey, you know, man, we're on page four, you know, or five or seven. You're wasting time. And it's like that old tortoise in the hair. I'm like, hey, hey, you can go because I feel like, and I've seen it year after year, whatever time I'm losing at the beginning, I'm going to make it up because I'm not going to have all the classroom management headaches, you know. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I believe in strongly. I think that's been a key ingredient to our success because those seven things I spoke of in the code of cooperation makes the music easy, even though they have nothing to do with the music. And it presents in the first days I presented in such a way that even a 10 year old could understand it. You know, what's the old saying, the teacher saying we reap in May, what we sow in September. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we forget that. Yeah. yeah. No, wow. well, I remember it every May. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're right. You know what? You're right. I think we all remember it. It's just <laughs> some of us remember it because we're like, dang, we didn't sew. And others remember it because, like, I'm so glad we sewed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's usually, I mean, you're never perfect, right? There's always something that slips oh, no. through the cracks. Always so. something to work on. Yeah, yeah. For everybody. You mentioned them really quick. You kind of flew through them, but you, the first one is follow directions. Now, do you have them say all seven every day? Oh, yes, absolutely. And they they can tell them to you better than me. Yeah. So yeah. my my <laughs> listeners, I know my listeners, they're gonna try to write these all down. So can you go slow? Can you do each one? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So so the first one is follow directions. Um, and this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll matter of fact, I'm gonna step back and, and redo that because I'm gonna present it just like I would in class. Okay. Because then the okay. next question people have is, okay, Mickey, if we're doing this every day, that's gonna eat up the whole class period. I'm like, absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. Because that first day's lasting ways program lasts about 10 days. And what I'm about to go over with you, I can do in 10 minutes at most. But right now I'm going to do it in about, I don't know, 45 seconds. Maybe. All right. All right. It's super simple. So if, if the kids came in, they're getting seated because I have a procedure from the moment they step outside the band hall to the moment they get in. And that's covered in first day's lasting ways. Um, once they come in, they have a seat. I say first one is they shout back, follow directions. And I'll say something like this. Hey, I'm a boss you until you become a boss. Okay. Nobody's really trying to boss you, but the, the goal is for me to give you the information to the point I don't have to tell you anymore. So your goal is to be a boss. Every kid gets that. Number two, raise your hand to speak. And as I do these things, I'll model it physically. So as I'm saying it, I'm going to raise up my hand. I say, raise my hand, raise your hand to speak. And I'll tell them something simple. I got two ears, but I can only hear one person. Kid doesn't understand that. Say, so let's just make sure we're doing things the right way. I said, the worst thing I might do if you raise your hand, the worst thing I might say is give me just a moment, but I'll never ignore you. Man, kids love that. They love it when you say that kind of stuff. And then you have to mean it. Then after follow directions, raise your hand and speak. Then number three is stay in your seat. And I'll even kind of bend my knees a little bit to make it look like I'm sitting in the seat because I want to model it. I want to give them a visual you know, presentation of what it is we're, we're, we're asking of them. And I'll tell them something simple like this. Hey, it's not a hostage situation. You're more than welcome to get out of your chair at any point in time. However, first one is, and they'll shout it back, follow directions. You got it. You have to follow the correct procedures, the correct guidelines and strategies. So if you need to get out of your chair, what do you do? And as I, as I ask them that question, I'll raise my hand. i to raise your hand to speak. If you raise your hand, then I'll let you get out the chair. But the worst thing I might tell you is not right now. Let's wait five minutes or right, to the end of class. After follow directions, raise your hand to speak, stay in your seat. The next one is be prepared. And then, you know, I'll do a litany of different things. When Lion King came out, I sang like Scar, be prepared. He has that little part in the middle of the movie. Kids like that kind of stuff. But you can teach a number of different things. Hey, make sure you bring your pencil. Make sure you have your horn every day, guys. And celebrate those people that are prepared. I use that as an opportunity to celebrate. Man, Susie always has her instrument. Man, shout out to Susie. You do a great job. After follow directions, raise your hand, speak, stay in your seat, be prepared. Next one is respect property of others. I explained to them the story about how I got my instrument and how our instruments are a story. And I have, my story changed my life. My question is, what's your story? Maybe mom and dad just went out and bought it. That's great. Maybe Papa passed it down to you. Maybe mom had to get an extra job. See, nobody really knows what your story is, but it's not an instrument you're holding. It's a legacy. It's a legacy. It's your story. Nobody has a right to rewrite, has a right to rewrite your story or mess up your story. So we keep our hands on our own instruments. After follow directions, raise your hand, speak, stay in your seat, be prepared to respect property of others. The next one is treat others with respect. And I tell them all the time, you may not like everything that I say. I, it might even hurt your feelings. I may say terrible things like, do it again. 
and go practice. I have horrible things that may annoy and aggravate you, but nothing I say will be purposely to disrespect you. But if I do something that is disrespectful, then there's a time at the end of the class. Please bring it to my attention, and I will listen to you. I will hear you. But we're not going to be disrespectful in the class. And then finally, fo- uh, follow directions. Raise your hand. Speak, stand. You see, be prepared. Respect property of others. Cheers with respect. Gum, candy, food, or drinks are not allowed. So those are the seven. The last one is a fun one. I tell a very colorful story about a young boy, a bag of Cheetos, a saxophone, and an unwelcome varmint guest uh, that, that, that joined the band and uh, that person may have found in their saxophone uh, by accident. And by the time I tell that story, I tell you, man, this is the cleanest room. And the, the, the custodians love, they fight over who gets to take the band hall uh, duty, the custodians do, because this, this bad boy is so clean, man. By the time I tell that story, nobody brings anything in here. And then when I'm all finished with it, um, I always tell them, don't just talk about it. And they shout back, be about it. Meaning don't just let it be something you say. Let it be something that you do, something that you model, something that you become. Um, and I would say to be or not to be, that's the answer. And that's your job to be the very things that we've said in here. Yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Bobby Lambert, who teaches at uh, uh, Wando High School in South Carolina. And Bobby, his first gig was to be was the assistant band director up at Marian Catholic in Chicago. And Marian Catholic is one of those legendary marching band programs. They won like, yeah. I mean, I'm not even going to say how many national championships they won or grand nationals. I don't know that stuff. But um, he talks about Greg Bim, their director, and how Greg was so much about the little things that he interrupted a marching rehearsal because someone had left a bag of McDonald's on the bus. And he's like, this is not yeah. what we do every day. This is not who we are. You know, it's those little things that add up to big things. And kids are looking for that. They want to know, are you really about what you say you're about? And, and, they, and, they, and they test boundaries. And, and I hear folks all the time and um, and I, me included, I'm, you know, we're all growing, man. I'm not, not here to say I got it all together, you know, but, but, but we do have a, a good tradition here in this band program. And the fact of the matter is I, I hear folks that get upset when kids push the boundaries and they'll, they'll be like, man, these kids are acting so childish. And I'm thinking to myself, yes, exactly. They're children. Children are going to be childish. The question is as adults, are we going to be adultish? And what do I mean by adultish? You're phenomenal. If you're an adult, if you're a sound adult, then you're more than a teacher. You're more than a coach. It's almost like you're a mentor. You like Yoda. Like, you know, you're Yoda for Skywalker, right? So, so when you're in a sound adult, not only are they listening to what you're saying, they're looking at who are you? Who are you truly being in this moment? And when you say for us to do those things, it puts a, it puts a responsibility on me. I can't bring food in the band hall. I'm the doggone band director. But they watching me. And man, if, and look, sometimes people will bring us a treat, you know, like, like a, a parent might bless us with something and bring something in or all the eyeballs start looking. Is he going to eat it in the band hall? And I tell them, I put it down on my desk. They can't have it right now. I have to wait till after class. And they're like, wow. And that means something special. It's like, okay, let's work. Let's, let's put in the work. Cause I see he's, he's, he's not only just talking about it, like we said before, but he's being about it as well. That's what they want to know. And I believe every child is one sound adult away from discovering that very sound that we were talking about before. They're looking to it. So I always tell educators when I do conferences and clinics and workshops uh, where we talk about professional and personal development, I, I give them this challenge. I say, will you be the sound to change the world? Let us be the sound to change the world. Let us be that unique significance that they're looking for. Yeah, it's, it's rules, but it's more than rules. It's, it's showing them what's possible when you do things with excellence, doing things with excellence each and every day. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm all about that. I think that's terrific. And you know, the crazy thing is we covered all this ground and still haven't played an instrument. And then the crazy part is for me, the kids the kids are at this point, they're buying in, you know, but they're getting antsy. You know, they're ready to play the instrument. Well, I try not to aggravate my kids, but I I do a little Mr. Miyagi thing where uh we still don't play the instruments. Like now it's now it's like early September. Um and what we do is we lay the foundation. I call it level one. So for level one, what we do is I got seven things that we adhere to. And these things have nothing to do with music, but they got everything to do with music. In the sense, the first thing we work on is holding still, posture. And now somebody might say, well, Mickey, it's just posture. It's not that big of a deal. It's huge. It's huge because as you said before, the seeds that you sow, or as I like to say, you reap what you sow greater than you sow later than you sow. 
And sometimes we get something down the road and we're like, I don't like how this turned out, but we have to ask ourselves, what did we sow at the beginning of it? And when I go into classes, um, a lot of times I'll see variations on the, on the posture. I'll see so many variations on, on how the kids are sitting and how they're holding the instruments. And then it starts to come through on the plane, you know? Um, so it's so much easier, especially if you have a large group to keep them all somewhat uniform because it, it helps you with error detection. It helps you with the development. You're not starting from 17 different starting points. You, you, you're actually beginning with one unified place. And it's so much easier to go back and correct and diagnose. So with the posture, I give them this long, drawn-out explanation of it. And then I go back and I say, okay, somebody tell me uh, exactly how posture operates. Well, none of them can tell me because I gave way too big an explanation. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, look, let me break it down to you this way. And I'll go through and I'll give them a little bit shorter explanation of it. And I'll say, okay, who can t tell, tell it back to me? And nobody really, because it's still just a little bit too long, because I believe it's super important to have catchy things that kids can take with them forever. And then finally, I'll, I'll start doing a little beatbox thing. Now they're looking at me crazy. Like, okay, my man, I think my man, I think he just lost it. <laughs> he was just talking to his nice beatboxing. And as I'm doing this, I'll say, first, you got to sit tall, let your shoulders fall, make a meet in the back and put your feet down flat. You got to sit tall, let your shoulders fall, make a meet in the back and put your feet down flat. Then I'll point to them and instinctively they start saying it. Sit tall, shoulders fall, beat the back, beat flat. And everybody loves, now all of a sudden, everybody loves posture. It's amazing. It's a music miracle. Then I, I tell them to say it back, and they can all say it. And I say, you know what? That's cool and everything, but that's still not efficient enough. And they look at me, and I, you know, I'll ask them what efficient means, all that kind of stuff. Little things that we sometimes forget. Sometimes we say stuff, we just keep rolling. But we don't ask ourselves, do the kids actually know what efficient means? Do they actually know what some of these terms that we're using are? So I'll ask them that. And... Um, I'll say, now, here's, here's what we got to do to make this thing work. In band, we don't talk about it. We what? And they shout it back. We be about it. I said, yeah. So that's going to require nonverbal. Do me a favor. Before we go all the way there, can you, can you think, sit tall, shoulders fall, meet in the back, feet flat in your head? Can you say it quietly to yourself real quick? And I count them down, 10, 9, and they do it. Then I say, how many of you could, I say, boy, I don't even know if I got anybody that could do this. And the moment you tell a kid, I don't know if I got somebody that can do it. Half the boys are like, I can do it. I can do it, you know, because they're competitive. I say, is there anybody who could take all that stuff in their head like in two seconds? I know that's real difficult. Oh, boy, the hands come up. I can do it in two seconds. And then well, I'll say, well, let's see if we can do it. But not only do you have to say it in your head, but you have to demonstrate it. And it's the cutest thing when you see these kids they mentally going through the checkpoints and physically showing it. Like you can see them sitting tall. You can see them letting their shoulders relax, letting the shoulders fall. You can see them making the shoulder blades meet in the back, and you can see them putting their feet down flat. And you see some of them forget, and all I got to do now is look at their feet. And when I look at their feet, it means something because it means something to them. And then after a while, I'm like, hey, by the way, there's a special word I'm going to say. I said that word is S-E-T. Now, I'll never say the word. I spelled it on purpose because if I'm, it's almost like magic. If I say this word, it's got to happen. What's got to happen, Mr. Smith? All those things we just said. So they get it. So then all of a sudden, I, I give them the instruction. Okay, I'm standing by the podium, guys. In just a moment, I'm going to step on the podium. And when I do, okay, I'm going to say that word, S-E-T, okay? And I want you guys to do it. Here we go. Boy, I got their eyes. I never like to waste the word either. Sometimes we waste time. You know, I would never talk to the kids and use as much verbiage as I'm doing right now with you, you know? But I want everything compact and quick. So when I step on the podium, I say set and pew. They all get it. Then I say, boy, y'all the best class I ever had. I said, you know what? I think we're probably so good. I don't even have to say that word. Could we try it without saying it? Well, how will we know? I'm glad you asked. Sometime I'll lift my hand up. Sometime I'll step on the podium. Let's see if you can figure out the nonverbal cues. Now, what am I doing? I'm getting engagement. I'm establishing a foundation for classroom engagement. So now a lot of times they don't listen because we're not giving them anything to listen to. And again, I'm not, not trying to throw shade at anybody, not trying to put anybody on blast. I'm just, I'm just being frank. You know, sometimes we don't even realize we do ourselves a disservice, but I'm giving them the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving them the specific things they need to look for for them to go to this place called success. What did we call it before? The GPS, the Guidelines, Procedure, Strategies. So now when I get back up there, I don't even say anything. I just lift my hand. Bam, the class got it. Now they're in a position where they have to watch me because they don't know what I'm going to do. Matter of fact, I might be in the middle of a sentence, and I might say, set, and then they get there. We make a game out of it. 
And it becomes something like, what is Mr. Smith going to do next? As opposed to, oh, we got to go back to that class, you know? And that's the kind of things we do in, in what I call level one. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, I, I, do, I do share in more detail, you know, through my educators page, all those things. But, you know, posture, looking at the conductor, uh, toe tapping, breathing in, breathing out. Um, I will say with that one, that's a funny one. When, when I ask them the question, I say, how do you breathe? And uh, I tell them the answer is, how do? And they look at me kind of weird. And I say, the question is, how do you breathe? The answer is, how do? And then finally, I don't know how well it'll communicate on this phone, but I'll say, the question is, how do you breathe? And the answer is, and they get it. Oh, so when we breathe in, the inhalation is how, and then we exhale, that's do. And that's actually setting up the stage for how to, for the articulation down the road. Um, you see what I'm saying? So it makes it simple. And then when I get to that other stuff, and I tell them all the time, first days, I'm going to teach you wrong so you get it right. So there's some things that I'm saying on here that may not be fundamentally true, but I'm working with a 10-year-old. I got to get them started. I get it. You know, training wheels aren't fundamentally true either, but what kind of crappy dad would I be if I put my, my three-year-old, my four-year-old out there on a 10-speed on bike? You know, I got to give them, I got to give them training wheels. And then eventually we take those little things off, those little training wheels off, and we watch them fly. We watch them soar, man. And uh, that's what we do. And like I said, first day's lasting ways. It's a powerful avenue for you to create your best sound in a way where you don't get burned out as a teacher, but at the same time, the kids are having fun and they having so much fun. They don't even realize they learn it <laughs> all working hard. Remember your first term of teaching, learning all the skills that you don't get taught in music school, managing a transitioning culture in your classroom, finding out that you have to teach guitar this term. During those early years, we found out that leaning on a community of music educators was important, not only for building that knowledge in ourselves, but also maintaining enough sanity to serve the students right in front of us. Amused is a podcast centered around a community of music teachers. Between the four of us, we teach choir, band, orchestra, general, jazz, and marching band at the elementary through collegiate levels. We certainly don't have all the answers, but you're welcome to listen in while we try to find them. Join us while we work through the challenges of music teaching and celebrate the joy of bringing music making into the lives of young people. In each episode, you'll hear stories, both good and bad, about that week of teaching, and we'll try and tackle an issue that one of us is struggling with. Something we're all taught is that music brings people together, but being the only teacher in your subject at a site can be really isolating. We think everyone ought to be a part of a community, and you're welcome to come join ours. Episodes come out on Wednesdays during the school year, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and at amusedcast.org. I lost you on I lost you on Skype. We'll do FaceTime. So yeah, so we were talking about you teach you using your first day's lasting ways to teach your son. You know, I was just thinking, you know, I'm home and I've got all these instruments in my house, and my daughter's finishing up third grade, and I'm thinking, man, this is a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she wants to play saxophone, so just so you know. Yeah, baby. Yes, indeed. Good for her. That's, what, that's it, man. You know, it's funny. It, it, I don't know how you feel about it, but my, I have two children. Me and my wife have two children. We got, we got a daughter who's 16, and our son is 10, okay? And, man, sometimes you think you know more, uh, but they know. They know sometimes. They, they Both of them actually said what instruments that they wanted to play, mm -hmm. and I doubted it. Yeah, like yeah, when they yeah. first said it, I was like, nah, you're not going to want to do that, you know, to myself. And But when I tell you, you know, my daughter wanted to play the guitar, okay? And she's real dainty, and, you know, she doesn't like being uncomfortable. And I'm like, she's not going to like those calluses. She gets on her fingers and a few other little things. And it's awkward. But when I tell you she's flourished at it, she plays French horn. I'll be honest, I didn't give her much of a choice on that. Uh, I just put on, <laughs> her mom played French horn. She's got a great ear. She sings great. I was like, eh, you're doing French horn scholarship for mom and daddy. Uh, my son has been saying since he was maybe three years old that he wanted to play the trumpet. But I didn't really believe it because, I, you know, one of my best friends plays trumpet. And I thought he was in his ear. You know, I thought I thought Uncle Ray was trying to convince him to play the trumpet. I really did think that's what it was, you know. And uh, fast forward, he gets this trumpet. And when I tell you, I mean, he practices every day on his own. Um, he does his lip slurs. He does his Remingtons. Like, he, he even got his mom to, uh, he got my wife to get him one of those old school kitchen timers. You know, little wind up ones. Yeah. And he turns his kitchen timer on 10 minutes. You know what he does? Does a little warm up. 
mouthpiece work, and then he goes immediately into his other little study, and then he, you know, he does, he's picking up songs by ear, man. Like, he's in there, like, trying to figure stuff out. And I said, who would have thought? You know, sometimes the horn picks them, you know, as much as they pick it. But I, I use a lot of the first day's lasting ways things because it's catchy. You know, it's easy for him to remember. And it puts it in a way that he can understand it. And I even, you know, use um, use some things even with the with the the counting system that that just, you know, helps him understand it better. And all those little things makes it fun because sometimes, and again, not to put anybody on blast, I just sometimes I think we forget to make it fun as well. And, you know, I, I, I believe in discipline. Don't get it twisted. If you come into my classroom, I have much order and structure, but I'm always cognizant of the fact that, hmm, they're children. Specifically, they're someone's child. And that person made an investment in them because they wanted to see their child have fun. Now that I have kids, if my kid's playing soccer or if they're doing something and I don't see where they're having a good time and the coach is yelling at them and all this kind of stuff, as a parent, I'm going to be less inclined to support. As a parent, maybe we won't, we won't make the next practice. As a parent, I'm not going to bend over backwards to get them to that game, you know, for them not to play in the game or for them to be berated or for them to lose even, you know. So, so each and every day, I tell them whether it's Sunday through Saturday, every day is a Wednesday, W-I-N-S. My job is to help them find the win. Every day. And that doesn't mean we don't work hard. There's some days, boy, I'm just in here, figuratively speaking, I'm just browbeating them, man. I mean, we are, we are just, we're just putting the, putting the hold of the, uh, the plow to the, to, the, to the ground there. We're really, really working. But if I see where I've, I've, I've made more of a withdrawal than I've made the deposit, then I'll always make a point before the class is over with to do something that leaves a good deposit. You know, and emotionally, that's what we that's what we try to do each and every day. when We come in here. That's why for me, you know, we got about 50 percent of the school is in the band. So normally where uh, for a discipline matter, uh, a teacher might go to an administrator and we got great administrators. So but 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 hear this where they might go to an administrator or a coach. They'll come meet me. They'll say, hey, bring them to Smith because they know it's not that I'm so mean or I'm so big or I'm so bad. But if I say something. If I say, hey, that disappoints me, that hurts them. That hurts them because it's not just some dude saying it. He's been taking time since the first days. And, and, and I think we forget sometimes how meaningful our role is. That's why I call it a sound adult. You know, we are a sound adult because we see them sometimes more than their parents. We definitely see them more than the other teachers do. You know, because if you're that sixth grade science teacher, you literally see them for a year. And then they're just a passerby for the other two years, you know, in the middle school. Um, if you're at the high school level and you you teach them, you see them four years. But if you're that if you're that if you're that that chemistry teacher, you see them one year, maybe a semester, and then they're passerbys the next time. But for us, I see my kids basically four years because I spend fifth grade. You might as well say I'm a fifth grade teacher, man, because I'm at the fifth grade all the time. I am I am the unofficial spokesperson for the middle school. <laughs> at the elementary school that feeds me. I mean, and I feel like as a band director, or orchestra director, or choir director, if your feeder school does not, if if you can't walk into your campus and the whole place goes crazy, then I think you need to, you need to reevaluate the, 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 the recruitment. I think, I think when you step onto the campus, there should be an excitement. People should know who you are. Like, and that starts before the spring. Like I'll go, I'll go eat lunch with them sometimes. I'll go walk down the hallways with them. I'll sit down with them in library. I'll go to, and read stories with them. I wrote a children's book. And a lot of times I'll go down there and read the children's book to the kids. And not just the fifth graders. I try to catch them in first or second, third grade, fourth grade. Build relationship. That way, that's why they, people can't figure out, why do so many kids sign up? Because they've been waiting to get to me. I'm not just this dude that just showed up. And things started getting close to middle school. I'm, I'm making an investment. I'm making a deposit early. And I think for so many kids... Um, that's why they respond so well. It's not because I'm such a great guy. Uh, it's because there's trust. And that, in a nutshell, is what this whole thing is about. Because so many times we're in a, we're in a rush to instruct, but we've not taken the time to develop trust because trust creates the relationship. But from the relationship comes influence. And then from influence, then you can instruct. 
but you can't instruct somebody when there's no capacity for influence. We don't learn well from people we don't like, believe in, or trust. Doesn't mean they have to like everything that I say, but you got to know it's coming from a good place. And I, I, I truly believe my students know, uh, number one, I'm not perfect. But they also know that anything that I say is coming from a place that says you're loved, you value, and you're wanted. You know, I always think about this. People talk about their, their favorite teachers. You know, I remember the, the history teacher I had who was really tough, who was really yeah. honest all the time and who called my parents all the time. And you know who I don't remember? I don't remember the name of the, the coach who taught us geography and read the newspaper every day when he gave us handouts. I don't remember that dude's yeah. name. But I'll never forget Miss Boynton. You know what I mean? That's what I tell folks all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, those are the things you, you're right. Those are the things you remember. And you remember them by name. Like, I'm listening to you. Yeah, you're calling yeah, yeah. their name out. <laughs> you know? And, and the thing is, you don't remember. And, and since, since you mentioned that, when you think about that teacher, and I challenge anybody that's listening today, think, take, take like five seconds and think about your favorite teacher, that person that made the biggest impact for you. For me, it was Durland Paul Ancelet. Like you said, he was a military guy, like Army dude, right? Tough as nails. But, but watch this. When you think about that person, okay, rarely do you think about what they taught. You think about the way they made you feel. Yes, first. yes. That's the first thing you remember. And, 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 you know, my, when I think about music, man, my high school director made that thing really pop off for me. He, man, when I tell you my high school band director, his name is Jay Ecker, man. He's, he's since retired. You know, he's still living and with us and all that good stuff. Matter of fact, he's a successful business owner in our area, uh, runs some some uh, eating restaurant entertainment establishments and stuff like that. So he he definitely pours back into the arts in a powerful way. But but when I first knew him, he was Mr. Ecker and he was a great, incredibly passionate teacher. But man, when I tell you this dude could play a bass like nobody's business. I mean, in any, any, any genre, any style. I mean, he'd do the upright bass, play with the symphony, do jazz gigs, do some funk like you wouldn't believe. I mean, could do anything. I thought dude, I thought dude walked on water, hung the moon, you know what I'm saying? And he's the first person that showed me you don't have to have band director child. <laughs> you could be a great teacher and cut it up, you know, on the stage too. And the best part about all that, as talented as he was, I always felt like he cared about us. He gave us this, this phrase that he would say all the time. Uh, you know, Dr. Tim says it, never settle for less than your best. And that stayed with me. That stuck with me so much that, that even today I find myself echoing that, you know, um, his, his, his legacy lives on in the classroom, even though he's not teaching anymore. And, and I'm telling you that because even though he was tough on us, that's the thing I remember. Now on the flip side, my middle school band director, who he was a nice gentleman, okay? I don't want to disparage him, nice gentleman. But you know what's sad? My memory of him is basically him telling me not to worry too much about music, that I could run pretty fast because I was good in track, and I could jump pretty high. I was pretty good at basketball. And he said, I wouldn't worry about this music thing. You know, folks from the community you come from, they don't, you know, you know, the basketball track probably be something better you're at. And, you know, when you're, when you're like 12, I didn't understand fully what he was saying, <laughs> well, yeah. but I remember it made me angry and I understand now why it made me angry. I told you before, everybody has a sound. They have a purpose and a passion. And when you call into question somebody's sound, man, you call into question their essence, you know? And I didn't know that at 12. I didn't know one day I was going to be an award-winning educator, band director. I didn't know that, but I knew that what he was saying just wasn't jiving like that wasn't it was was like no man no there's something about this music thing and unfortunately he's probably did a thousand great things mark he probably did he probably did maybe ten thousand great things for me obviously somebody had to start me you know so so he was there at my start i don't i never want to discredit him or take that away but look at what i remember look what the legacy was it was those few words he said so that's why with each day you know none of us are perfect but I want to make sure the totality of who I am outweighs that one or two moments. So, again, I don't want anybody to be uh, to misconstrue, misconstrue what I'm saying. If uh, we all have bad days, you know, we're all just humanity on display. 
but make sure each and every day that you're seeing the heart of the child as well as the music because you never know who's in your class. <laughs> you never know who that next kid's going to be, you know? No, I mean, that's that's absolutely right. It makes me think back on all the teachers who said things to me that either, you know, wanted to make me quit things or, or made me want to continue things. And, you know, I could kind of like run down the catalog. I think we all can. Anyone who's listening is probably doing the same thing. You know, our words have power. We're, we're mentor figures to these kids. You know, our sound can either resonate or it can repel. Because when teaching's done well, you know, it's an art form. And it creates a sound. That's why I, I tell folks in our, in, in our community that it's just that it's a community. It's not a, it's not a competition. It's a collaborative. So, so, so it, it's no different, like I said before, you know, the flutes aren't, the flutes aren't competing with the tubas. <laughs> they shouldn't be. You know, it's ensemble. We work together. Now, we can both play a particular melody. There's a theme that maybe could be shared, a motive that could be shared between those two groups. But it's never a competition. A flute's a flute tuba is a tuba well the same thing even though we're all teaching even though we're in this beautiful ensemble called music education it should never be a competition from that standpoint i'm not against competition but from a teacher standpoint i should be able to share i should be able to share my practices i got a buddy of mine right now he, he probably he's probably just losing his mind that I'm, I'm sharing my first day's lasting ways concepts but you know what some i didn't somebody shared stuff with me you know we, we all learn and grow together um you know that that's and then sometimes, too, you know, you pour the cup empty. It comes back twice as full. I can't express to you how many times I've shared something, and then somebody gave me something that was even better back, you know? It's just understanding that we're here to give. We're givers in this, in this game called music education. Yeah, that's why I do this podcast. You know, it's, I, didn't do yeah. it, I didn't do it looking for something, but, boy, it's given so much back to me. And it's, it's filled my cup more times than twice. You know, it's, it's changed my life. Yeah. I, I told people after Christmas, I, I presented at Midwest this year about the podcast and I did a special episode where I talked about it. And all it really was, was a reflection on what I've learned from this. And man, I went from being a college music theory teacher back to teaching, you know, fourth or eighth grade band and I can't be happier. You know, I, it, it's, it's, it's remarkable. You know, when you give up that sort of like, I have to do this because it's expected, you know, I have a doctorate, mm -hmm. I should be teaching college, but that's not making me happy. I said, man, I, I wish more people would just just follow their sound like that, you know, um, because you miss out. You miss out on so much. You miss out on so much, man. And um, I, 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 I definitely connect with that. You know, when I first came out teaching, I, I just knew I was going to do high school. I had no intention of doing middle school. But just like, you know, the kids, when they are picking out their instruments, uh, the instrument picks them as much as they pick it. It's funny, middle school picked me, man. And I tell folks, either you just love it. Look, there's no in between. You either love middle school or you don't. I, you just, you, you know, you love elementary or you don't. I call it the midget mafia, man. It's a, it's a tough group. You either love them or you don't, man. But, <laughs> but I, I, I have fallen madly in love with this age group because it's, for me, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Um, because you get to share this beautiful thing that, yeah, you know, I get to share this thing that changed my life, yeah. you know? in a way that could possibly change theirs. And they're at an age where they're not so baby that they can't appreciate it. They're old enough to be able to appreciate it, to be able to hold the instrument, to be able to create something with it. But they're still young enough to be incredibly impressionable. And that's why I say we need to have more people at that foundational level that, that help them discover the sound as a sound adult. Uh, because that's, that's where the fulfillment comes in at. You get to see these kids and they come back and I'm sure you could attest, you know, that they're, they're grown now and, you know, and they'll come back and, hey, I remember when you told us this and I'm still using this. And now some of my some of my colleagues, some of my teaching now, which is crazy. Uh, but but you just you get to see how this how we're more connected than we are separated, you know, in this thing called life. And music is just another one of those avenues. It's a vehicle to show them more, to show them what this world can be, man. It's uh, I, I can't imagine doing anything else you know for me the sound for me the sound is also an acronym so for educators i challenge folks to do a sound check every day because this thing it's an arduous journey but it's a hero's journey but it, i won't lie it's tough there's days there's days where it's challenging so so i tell folks when you teach it's like you're performing and when i perform my saxophone 
whether I'm in front of an audience or I'm at a jazz festival or anything like that, first thing you got to do is you got you got to fine tune your sound. You got to discover your sound. You got to work it up because nobody will want to hear a sound that's not developed and nothing's put on a platform that hasn't been perfected in a practice room. So discovering the sound and all those things we've talked about thus far, you know, as far as setting up your classroom management action plan, uh, making sure that you understand the why of what you're doing, all those good things balled into one that 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 helps to set up your unique sound that either the repels or resonates with the kids but then it's a step farther after you set up your sound then i believe it's setting the stage up which we talked about slightly you know as far as as far as how you procedures the classroom management the behavior management of the class all those things play a part and then it's knowing your audience too always being mindful of who they are that that there are distinct personalities in each class and i've learned that since having kids you know, when, when my children were born, you saw, you see day one, oh, they're going to be some kind of way. Like there's some person, like you can see, you know, my daughter, my daughter, she has this very nurturing and caring and curious personality. She's always mindful of others. She's very selfless, almost to a fault. And she's been like that since a child, since like a baby. My goddaughter, my goddaughter is a boss. She's like, she's three. And I can tell right now. She's going to be somebody's CEO. It's not, it's, it's not that she doesn't have compassion, but she is, she is just incredibly driven. You can see it. Like our, it doesn't even matter that she's three. There's just some, some, some distinct things you can see in her that are like, okay, they're night and day difference. And every child is individual and unique as well. And I can try as much as I want to try to make my daughter take on the characteristics of my goddaughter and vice versa, but it'll, it'll never happen. Now, I can help them appreciate different characteristics than others. But too many times we're trying to put a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. And it is a matter of seeing what we have and then building around that, knowing the audience. But that first comes from making sure we are our best selves. And I call that the sound check. So when you talk about sound, it's an acronym. S stands for see yourself beyond yourself. And that's really what we've been talking about in a nutshell. Understanding that I tell my students, it's not just about you, it's not just about me, but it's all about we. Being able to see in them more than uh, me wanting to just, you know, put my 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 way out there. Taking a second to ask, okay, who is this student that I'm trying to teach, or most importantly, I'm trying to reach daily. So with each and every day, it doesn't matter how I feel, I bring the best. And bring the best, I call it the law of the lid. I think John Maxwell talks about that. But but the law. Of the lid is this uh, that that the followers, in this case, the children, the students, will never give more than you give. That's why I talk about don't just be an adult, be a sound adult. So, so if here's the problem: too many times in my career, I went in giving a hundred percent, and then I was mad because they didn't. Well, by by virtue of the law of the lid, if I give a hundred percent, nobody else is going to. At best, at best, some, the, 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 I mean, top notch. That little girl on the flute in the flute section, first row, Miss Prissy, she gonna give eighty percent. Because they're not capable of giving exactly what you give. So what I have to do, I feel like I have to go above and beyond. That's why I say I go 180. So, yeah, do I do things that are probably unnecessary? Yeah, yeah. But I got to show them, man, I'm fighting. I'm working this. I'm working harder than you guys. And you know what? When they see the energy you put out, that thing's contagious. I tell my daughter all the time, I say, you're attractive. I say, but it's not what you think. Yes, you're beautiful, but attractive in the sense that whatever you put out is what you attract. And, and, and I say this, when I'm on the podium, rarely am I on the podium. I'm usually walking around the class. I'm getting between them. I'm, I'm at their level. Uh, but I want them to see first and foremost, man, this dude's giving 180. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and do 100. And then I win. <laughs> you win. So, you know, that's what it's about. And, and somebody said, well, what if you're not feeling it? And they're like, well, okay, fake it till you make it. Faith it till you make it. That's your thing. But most importantly, this is what I believe. I believe we've all got more in the tank than we often realize. So I just say face it till you make it. Just face it till you make it each and every day. But that only starts. That only happens if you if you have the GPS, if you know where it is you're trying to go. OK, because because if you don't know where the destination is, it's hard to meet the goal each and every day. So as educators, we have to show up incredibly prepared, not for the sake of a lesson, but for their sake. Because you can't take somebody somewhere you don't know where you're going. So, so we talk about seeing yourself beyond yourself, operating optimism and excellence. U stands for utilize all available resources. 
And that's super important because you don't want to get into the comparison game. It's so easy to look at somebody else's situation and say, boy, if I had that, if I had that, we could all say that. But the cool thing is everything you need is already in the house. Everything you need is already there. Now, you know, it's easy for me to say now, if you walked into my band hall, it looks really, really nice. They just built a brand new one. And people forget when I first got here, we only had about 28 kids in the band program. And my, and my band hall was probably maybe 15 by 30 feet long. I mean, you know, in, in width and size, tea tiny little thing. Okay. And that's not, that's not even including storage cubbies and everything. So it was real, real small, but made the most out of that. And I believe again, whatever you sow is what you reap. And I learned that principle very early when I was dating my wife. Um, well, she, well, I guess dating who would be my wife. I guess I should clarify. <laughs> I was dating her. We were in college and she lived in Texas. And in order for me to visit her, I had to drive my old clankety car. I had an 88 Dodge Spirit, man. Oh, yeah. And that thing couldn't go more. It couldn't go more than five miles. Man. Was it blue? No, it was, this was a tan one. Oh, okay. You had, you had a Dodge Spirit? No, I could see the blue one in my head, though. Kind of like a baby blue. Yeah. We, we had a tan one, man. That bad boy would die like every or overheat like every five miles. And I'll never forget, I'm driving back on one of these little back roads in Louisiana because it was too bad to drive on the interstate. I didn't want to get run over on the interstate. So I'm driving back on this back road, and it's getting dark, man. The sun's going down, and this is not the most pleasant place to be stuck in <laughs> after the sun goes down, okay? And uh, so I'm getting a little nervous, and I'm standing outside my I was standing next to my car and nobody's stopping, man. Nobody's stopping. They're just driving by. And then finally I see the sun's starting to set. And I'm like, well, I have no cell phone reception. I said, I just have to push this car or something. I saw something fall off in the distance. So I started pushing. No sooner than I started pushing my car. Do you know what happened? People started pulling over and they began helping. And that left, that left something powerful in me. It reminded me that oftentimes People are waiting to see what you're going to do in the situation. People are inclined to help you when they see you putting in the work. Um, and it's been so easy for me just to stand outside the car and say, eh, it's not working. And there would have been nothing wrong with that. But by virtue of me pushing the car, it, I don't know, it just it made an impact on somebody to where they're like, let me invest. And I've seen that happen even in my program here. Putting in that work has brought the right people into my life. Why? Because we're all attractive. And if you put in the work, you're going to attract those folks that want to see you succeed, you know. Um, and I think that's what I mean when we talk about utilize all available resources. Just use what you have. Put in the work and you'll see the benefits will come. And then N stands for nourish relationships. And that's what we've been talking about all day today, seeing more past, seeing more than just the notes. Yes, the notes are important. Yes, it's, incre it's incredibly important to tune the mouthpieces. Yes, the clarinets have to be set to a concert F sharp in order for the opposite <laughs> to be set properly. Yes, the flutes have to be on a concert A on the head joint. Yes, all those things are important. And we could spend hours talking about that. But what good is it if the child themselves never discover their sound, if the child never gets in tune? And it's not until you lose a few kids. I've, I, you go to enough funerals of students that you, it starts changing your perspective. And again, I'm not in here trying to make best buddies OK, I want to definitely, definitely preface this by saying uh, it's not your job to be their best friend. OK. And I tell my kids all the time, I say, I love y'all, but I don't need a 12 year old friend. I'm good. I'm a grown man. I don't need a friend. But what I can be is I can be a sound adult. I can be that person that pours into you. And 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 that's a level of friendship. But it's not it's not we're not like Facebook friends. We're not TikTok friends or anything like that. Um but that nourishing of relationships is incredibly important because, again, you can't instruct until there's trust developed. And then finally, D stands for don't stop. Keep on going. And I think that that message is incredibly important in this season. That's more than anything what I want to share with this new platform, you know, as, as, as a Grammy music educator. Um, it's not about the award. It's about the opportunity to engage, to educate, and to elevate everyone to excellence. And to remind them and show them that there's a reward, but it happens in due season if you don't quit, if you don't faint, if you don't give up. And I believe everybody has that beautiful, beautiful moment, that those signature moments that are just ahead of them. That's why I say if you continue going and make, make your next steps, your best steps, then you'll discover a sound like none other. I was getting ready to quit, man. 
I was getting ready to quit in 2014. And I went to my table to write a letter of resignation. And it just so happened that I got three letters in the mail from former students, handwritten. 12th grade teacher told them uh, to write a letter to a teacher. Now, before I share that with you, I need you to understand four years prior to that, there was a little girl who was in my band who was very, very energetic, little clarinet player, very bubbly. But all of a sudden, her demeanor started changing. And I'm sure you've seen stuff like that, where the, the kid, you know, has a shift in personality. And usually there's always a factor behind that. I tell folks, kids come to school with two backpacks, one that you can see and one that's invisible. But both of them have to be unpacked in order to reach them. And that invisible backpack comes with the challenges they bring from home, insecurities, um, self-worth issues, tons of different things. Um, so this little girl, I noticed a change in her, and she she was la she was late to class, and I greet all the kids by the door, uh, right outside the door, and she walked up, and her head was hung low, and I looked, and I looked at her, I said, hey, I see you. Now, I'm telling you that because normally I say good morning, I say hello, I've never said that before, but on that day, I said, I see you, and she still had her head hung down low. Well, I'm a stubborn old mule, man, because I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you beat me, so she kept her head down, I got down almost on my knee to get at her level. I said, hey, hey, Miss Jones, I see you and I smile. Going back to that modeling what you what you want them to be. And she smiled a little bit, picked her head up, and then she put it back down and went into class. Never said another word. Participated. You know, she was a fantastic student, but never mentioned another word of it. Fast forward four years later, I'm at my kitchen table getting ready to write my letter of resignation, took the paper out and everything. And I see these three letters and I begin reading them. All three letters were from three band students who were instructed by their 12th grade teacher to find the most impactful educator pre-K through 12th grade, the person that made the biggest difference in their life and write them a thank you letter and tell them why they're important. All three students wrote me a letter. The thing that was so powerful about this was not one of those students continued in, with band in high school. But when you ask them, what was the most impactful teacher and moment, it all pointed back to band. That's why I understand and believe now more than ever, it's not just about the subject matter, but it's showing the students that they matter. It's about that relationship. Relationship-based education is modern day teaching. We have to connect with them in a meaningful way before we get any type of meaningful results. So, so I'm reading these letters and the, you know, it's, it's they're beautiful. And then I get to the last one and it's from that little girl who's now getting ready to graduate from college that year, um, uh, from high school that year. And she says to me, I always loved your class because you saw the best in us. And she mentioned a few different things. She said, you may not have known this, but I was going through a lot at that time. And I didn't know. I know now uh, when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, I understand now that suicide is the second leading cause of death in our young people. I get that now. But back then I was just trying to get hot cross buns and be flat scale. I didn't know. I didn't know all that. And she reads and she goes on as I'm reading that letter. She says, one day I came to class and it was the lowest I had ever felt. I felt I had no value. I felt I was worthless. She says, I felt like I was invisible. And on that day, you looked at me and you said, I see you. I had never said that before. Honestly, I've never said it since. I don't know why on that particular day I chose in that moment to say that one little girl, I see you. But she then goes on to say, even when I went to high school and I would fight those feelings to say, in essence, if I was gone, nobody would notice, nobody would care. She'd fight it off with the thought of, no, there's one person who would care. Mr. Smith said, I see you. He'd miss me if I wasn't here. I had no idea when I said those words, those would be the words that would carry her through into adulthood. She's now married. She now she recently had the first baby. Uh, her and her husband had the first baby of the new year this year, 2020, um, living a beautiful life, you know, and it all could have not been. And I shared that story and a woman who was listening um, at this event, I was sharing it at. She comes to me and she says, man, that's powerful. Just beautiful. I said, oh, thank you. She said, but you don't you don't fully get it. I said, oh, OK. I said, well tell me what is it she said when that girl was at her lowest your words was everything that she needed to keep on going little did you know that four years later when you'd be at your lowest professionally 
her words would be everything that you needed to keep on going. Because after I read that letter, I tore up my letter of resignation. Had no idea about the Music Educator Award or anything like that. Wasn't looking for it. Had no idea that I'd go on to be a finalist for it and then ultimately be where we're at today, celebrating the birth of her child this January, only two weeks later to be in Los Angeles receiving that award and hearing Alicia Keys say, we need you. But Alicia Keys has no idea that I almost quit the profession because I didn't feel like I was loved, valued, wanted. And now more than ever, I want educators, I want anybody that's listening under the sound of my voice to know you matter more than you realize and that every word you speak, every action that you take in that classroom creates a sound like none other. And that sound can be the absolute difference for a young person. It's not just about the music, even though that's incredibly powerful. It's about something more, something that lasts after the song is over. So that's why I always encourage folks, let's say it to ourselves this year. Let's be the sound to change the world. Let's take this time, you know, even in the craziness of this 2020 so far with, with this corona and all this stuff that's going around, um, what, a, what a still a beautiful opportunity to reflect and to ask ourselves the question, what sound am I making in my classroom? What sound, what is my sound? What's my legacy that I'm leaving? What are some things that I can be doing to create an even more powerful sound in this season? Because it's never been about music. It should have always been about the young people. It should have always been about the children. And if it's gotten away from that, I want to encourage somebody to just kind of reflect and, and retune and rediscover your sound so that your next sound can be the best sound for those young people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Man, I could talk to you all afternoon, Mickey, about music and teaching. Man, I, I appreciate it, man. This, is, this has been good. It's been good. It's just been therapeutic, man. Cause yeah, I mean, we're not being able to teach. Yeah, so thank you, man. Thank you. And thank the listeners, man. Thank y'all for listening in. Let's run through these final questions. Just get your thoughts briefly on these. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and so the first one is, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? When, when, kids, think, when kids think it defines them, then I think it's unhealthy. I think I think it should just be it should be an accent. It should just be it should be the icing on the cake. It shouldn't be the cake itself. How do you find a work life balance? And I, this is something a lot of band directors really struggle with. But then again, other people say, "I love my job. This is my balance." Yeah, yeah. Um, it goes back to doing the sound check um, each and every day, asking yourself those questions, uh, taking time. I, I take time first thing in the morning to just make sure I don't answer emails. I don't answer phone calls. I take about 30 minutes every morning. I get to school early and I do that so I can do that sound check. See yourself beyond yourself, operate in optimism and excellence, utilize all available resources, nourish relationships. And then I, I encourage myself to don't stop, to keep on going. And I have a little, a little I can make it available to you guys too. I have a little quadrant, a uh, little handout, printout uh, that I that I write in. What are some ways I'm going to meaningfully see myself beyond myself today? How am I going to operate in those ways? And I and I'm and I'm intentional about it. I think that's the way to stay healthy in this life is being consistent and being intentional. Being intentional and being consistent in everything that you do. All right, Mickey, this is a huge one, uh, hard to do quickly. But what are the challenges facing music education and band, and how do we best meet them? Uh, I, it's big, but I, I'm a, I'm gonna be concise with it. I think I think we need to get back to making sure that music is an essential element. I think it's showing the world that music is important because it's music. I think we've done ourselves a disservice to some extent is that we've connected music with ancillary things such as increased test scores and you know uh, team building and all and all those things are great, but but I think we have not done a good enough job of dictating the narrative of that music is important because music is music. When we do that, then we don't have to sell it anymore. I think that in some ways, this coronavirus and the, the distancing is bringing home the importance of the arts mm -hmm. and what fine arts mean to community and to nourishing our souls. I think so. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. All right, Mickey, this is my favorite question. I... If I had a time machine and I set it to the afternoon of your high school graduation, what are you telling yourself? <laughs> okay. Hey, it's funny that happened. So, so my advice would be simple. It's the name, it's the name of the children's book that I've written. 
it's one of the parts, of the, it's one of the components of the sound acronym. What I would tell myself is this, don't stop, keep on going. You know, my buddy wrote in my high school yearbook, um, he wrote, we met in band, he and I met in sixth grade band, he wrote, one day you're going to win a Grammy. He said, when you do, man, give me a call, we'll go together. And uh, <laughs> little did he know, I called him up to the band hall a few weeks back, and I had the yearbook. And I said, man, read what you wrote, man. And he read it. He laughed. I said, that's funny, huh? He said, yeah. I said, what you doing in three weeks? He said, shut up, man. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> that's awesome. So the time machine thing actually worked. But I, I, would, I would tell little Mickey that more than anything. Just don't give up. It, it looks bleak sometimes, but keep on going. All right, Mickey. So this is really not about your favorite piece. It's about the piece that means the most to you that, that really has some value. If you had a choice, what would be the final work that you'd perform or conduct or, or listen to? And it could be anything from a hymn to Mahler second. Wow. Um, for a lot of different reasons, I won't get into all the details, but I told you earlier, I lost, I've lost a few students. Um, Brian Balmer just wrote, wrote Moscow 1941. And uh, we performed that back in 2014, which coincidentally was the first year that I found out about the Music Education Award. And it was the first year I was nominated. Somebody in my community who had been trying to get me to be a professional musician. Um, I'm a pretty decent saxophone player, and they couldn't understand why I wasn't on the road more. Um, and I said, oh, if you think I... I said, if you think my saxophone is good, I said, my performance in the classroom is much stronger, I feel, and it's much rewarding. And they were like, man, shut up. No way. So they came in, unbeknownst to me, and watched me teach, and little did I know they nominated me. And that was the same year I lost one of my students. Um, and, the, and that was a special group as well, too. So that song always means something special. I haven't done it since then. Um, I'm saving it for that special moment. But that would be that would be it. All right. Is there anything coming up you'd like to share or promote? Yeah. Um, well, up until um, the the recent coronavirus, we had we had uh, the the Keep On Going tour, and I had a lot of dates locked in where I was going to share a motivational mixture of music and message with audiences across the country, specifically geared toward educators. Um, and this this tour uh, consisted of me coming in and working with your school district or your conference, and then doing breakout free breakout sessions with the music educators. So. Um, Des Moines, we're still coming your way. Calgary, Canada, we're still coming your way. Uh, you know, Los Angeles, we're still coming your way. I just don't know when. And and to the other folks I didn't mention, please charge it to my 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 brain and not my heart. We're still coming your way. Uh, but I would definitely want to encourage anybody to stay connected with me. And if that sounds like anything you'd be interested in, have me come and share with your school district because my classroom management strategies speak not only to band directors but core curriculum teachers as well. Uh, I provide that, and then I do a breakout session. Just reach out to me at MickeySmithJr.com on the website. So easy to remember. Mark, it goes like this. M-I-C-K-E-Y-S-M-I-T-H-J-R.com. You can find out more on the website. And if you just want to connect, I have a, a community on Facebook. It's no charge. It's free. It's open to the public. We just give freely and share. It's called Sound 180 Educators on Facebook. Uh, you have to join, and but we're, we 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 accept all. So come on in. Uh, it's sound s o u n d the number one, the number eight, the number zero educators, and uh, we'd love to have you join the family. How can people get? In, well, you just gave out how everyone get in touch with you, so I don't really need to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything everything on the website, MickeySmithJr. dot com, and from there you can uh, you can even find music too. And uh, I have music uh, that I've recorded. And uh, you can find out more about the story. I have a children's book there. And most importantly, you can connect and, um, and and be a part of the community and even have me come to your school. I just love to be able to share. Awesome. Mickey, thank you so much. This was terrific. Oh, man. Thank, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. And this is, uh, this is so powerful, man. Everything banned. Thank you again. Thank you.